الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى محمد صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب كربلاء رزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتكم وشفاعتكم في الدنيا والآخرة أما بعد فقد قال سيدنا ومولانا الإمام الباقر صلوات الله وسلامه عليه من لم يجعل الله له من نفسه واعظا فإن مواعظ الناس لن تغني عنه شيئا صدق مولانا الإمام الباقر صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد These days we commemorate two tragedies one on the 5th of the Hijjah or around the 5th of the Hijjah the loss of the great Imam Muhammad Al-Baqir Salawatullahi wa Salamuhu Alayh and shortly after although in a different year of course we also commemorate the tragedy of the loss and the martyrdom of Muslim Ibn Aqil Salawatullahi wa Salamuhu Alayh Al-Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salam and Muslim a link that links them both together is the tragedy of Karbala although Muslim Ibn Aqil died or was martyred before the tragedy of Karbala and Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salam was martyred after many years in fact after the tragedy of Karbala yet Imam Al-Baqir was present in Karbala he was about three or four years old and so he witnessed the tragedy and Muslim Ibn Aqil is the ambassador of Imam al Hussein Salamullahi alayhi to Kufa and he is another great personality both of those if we take a look at their lives we can learn a lot of important lessons but let's take a look at the hadith of Imam Al-Baqir that I started the session with today the hadith says the Imam says men لم يجعل الله له من نفسه واعظا the one who Allah سبحانه وتعالى does not keep an admonishment someone who gives him admonishment from himself من نفسه واعظا فإن مواعظ الناس لن تغني عنه شيئا Indeed, such an individual who does not admonish himself, no matter how much those pe people then admonish him, it will not benefit him, it will be useless. What does admonish himself mean? We have in the Ahadith the significance of tafakkur spending time to reflect in fact the Quran constantly praises those who do tafakkur yatafakkarun reflect and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ those who reflect in the creations of the heavens and the earth reflecting when people reflect from within themselves they think and they say I need to become a better person 
That kind of reflection is what we're thinking about and we're talking about. The reflection where we question ourselves and our actions. How can I become better? If a person does not do this regularly, when he does ghiba, he says to himself, why did you do ghiba? Why did you backbite someone else? What are you going to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How did you slander someone else? When someone plots to hurt a mu'min or has an agenda to hurt a community or a society or a nation or humanity, one needs to think, what am I going to do on the day of judgment when Allah asks me, why did you do this? And you think you can hide from Allah? You think you can say, no, 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 I meant this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he knows the unseen, the hidden, and the seen. What you hide, وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ And what the hearts hide. A person may come in front of you, say, yes, I love you, I care about you, I respect you. Behind your back, stabs you. Comes to you, says, well done, mashallah, you do a great job. The next day he goes and talks about you. Such people, they don't really sit down and admonish themselves. What are we doing in dunya? When are we going to learn to love each other and respect one another? Such people, no matter how much you speak to them, it's like falling on deaf ears. No matter how much you admonish them, it won't help, unfortunately. That's why I tell my, some of my youth, my brothers and sisters, how difficult is it to let go of haram music? Let go of it. How difficult is it for my, our sisters to wear the hijab? Put it on. How difficult is it to respect one another? How difficult is it to pray Salat on time? But sometimes, unfortunately, because of all this, because there is no self-admonishment, there is no self-reflection, there is no time spent where the human being starts thinking that how am I going to respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How am I going to face the akhirah, the consequences that will come? Imam al-Sajjad, salamullahi alayhi, in dua Abu Hamza Thumali, this beautiful dua. He describes the stages when a, the soul leaves the body. He says, salamullahi alayhi, وَارْحَمْنِي صَرِيعًا عَلَى الْفِرَاشِ تُقَلِّبُنِي أَيْدِ أَحِبَّتِي وَتَفَضَّلْ عَلَيَّا مَمْدُودًا عَلَى الْمُغْتَسَلِي يُقَلِّبُنِي صَالِحُ جِيرَتِي وَتَحَنَّنْ عَلَيَّا مَحْمُولًا قَدْ تَنَاوَلَ الْأَقْرِبَاءَ أَطْرَافِ جَنَازَتِي وَجُدْ عَلَيَّ مَنْ قُولًا قَدْ نَزَلْتُ بِكَ وَحِيدًا فِي حُفْرَتِي وَارْحَامْ فِي ذَلِكَ الْبَيْتِ الْجَدِيدِ غُرْبَتِي He says, O oh Allah, have mercy on me. وَارْحَمْنِي صَرِيعًا عَلَى الْفِرَاشِ Dying on my bed. And my family is looking at me, around me. Have grace, grace me, Ya Allah. When I am lying on the table, being washed, and my, my friends and my relatives are turning me. Embrace me, Ya Allah, with your mercy, with your compassion, as I am being carried by my loved ones. And help me, Ya Allah, when I am alone in my new home. 
This is the reality. This is self-admonishment. This is an example of self-admonishment. When a person reflects and thinks, how can I change myself? Self-admonishment is very important. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam emphasizes on it. He says, anyone whom Allah does not give him self-admonishment. Now, why does Allah give him? So someone will say, well, Allah didn't give it to me. It's he, does, he gives it to you as a consequence of your action. When you remember Allah, he will remember you. When you get closer to him, he will come closer to you. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ You remember me and I will remember you. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا And those who struggle to find our path, we will guide them to our path. So there is that initial struggle that the human being has to go through. And then Allah will guide you. Allah will take care of you. So when the person shows that attitude, Allah will help him guide him and he will reflect and remember he will learn what is right and what is wrong what is true and what is false people used to come to imam al-baqir salamullahi alayhi people who are not followers of the imam salamullahi alayhi they would sit in front of him trembling one of them says i sat in front of many ulama but he tells imam al-baqir i have never been shaken overwhelmed the way I am sitting in front of you. The Imam tells him, because do you know why? Because you're sitting in homes, in places, أَذِنَ Allah and يُرْفَعْ and تُرْفَعْ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ Allah. You're sitting in homes that are not just made of clay. No. These homes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given permission for them to be elevated. Of course, not physically, but in their spirituality. There is constant remembrance of Allah and dhikr of Allah in these homes. These are the Imam Salamullah. Those ulama sat down in front of these alims. Uh, the, the, in front of the Imam Salamullah Alayhi. These so called scholars. But did they change? Did they become followers of the Imam? No, unfortunately. And you wonder how come? SubhanAllah. When you see the truth is so clear, here is the Imam Salamullahi Alayhi. Ask him any question and he responds. And they have no answer. But SubhanAllah. This is when a person does not really do self-admonishment, self-reflection. And this is not just about us and Allah, but within the society, about our interaction with the society. It is said back in the old days, there was a man by the name of Hassan Al-Khayyat. Khayyat means the tailor. He lived in a particular city. One day, a visitor came to this city. Back in the old days, people did not have banks, did not have safes. So when a traveler would travel and bring, for example, some gold, some money, he would be worried to keeping it all, for example, in one place. And for example, the, the hotel or places of residence, he'd be worried. Because there were so many thieves back then. So what some people used to do is they would go around and they would ask people in the city, is there a virtuous man, a pious man in the city? He was well known for his piety, virtue. And they would guide him to someone and he would give the money as a loan or basically as a safe, as a trust with that individual. A visitor came to the city he asked around about some virtuous man, pious man. They pointed him to some businessman. He goes to the businessman. Indeed, he looked like a virtuous man, a good man, a pious man. He gave him some gold. He said, I have some gold. 
I would like to leave it with you, please. I said, sure, no problem. After some time, he went back to this businessman, told him, can I have my gold back, please? He said, what gold? He said, the gold I left with you. He said, I've never seen you. It's my first time seeing you. The man said, please remember, this is the one. I gave you some gold. And he said, no. You know, interestingly, some people say, look, these are the people of religion. Because sometimes we hear this accusation. Look, these are the religious people. I mean, what's the point of praying salat when people cheat and lie? It's better not to pray and me being like this. At least I don't cheat and lie. That's some people. What's the point of wearing hijab when those people who wear hijab, these ladies who wear hijab, they're so much, for example, they hurt others, they backbite, they do this. What's the point? At least I don't wear hijab, but I don't do these things. We say, first of all, this is not a valid argument. It's an invalid argument. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do the salat. So you have to do the salat because you're disobeying Allah otherwise. Now, if some person prays and steals, for example, or hurts people, or a person wears hijab and backbites and hurts, that does not mean we say the whole concept is bad. The whole thing is bad. This is the accusation against Islam these days. People see some Muslims doing some things or people calling them Muslims. They're not even Muslims. They don't even understand a thing of Islam. They don't even understand a letter of the Quran. They see them doing something wrong and then they say, look, here is what Islam is all about. It's not Islam. It's not Islam. Similarly, this is not the way to practice. We tell those people, those who pray and for example steal, we tell them, you are praying to Allah. You have to understand the virtue of Salat. The virtue of Salat means you have to stop doing these things. That lady who is not, who's wearing hijab and she's backbites and والعياذ Billah, everyone hates her and does not like to speak to her because of her attitude and actions. We tell her, you are a mu'mina, you have good manners. You need to have good manners. You're wearing the hijab. This is the hijab of Fatima, salamullahi alayha. That's the admonishment we say. Here, Imam, we have a hadith from the Imam. He says, لَمْ يَخُنْكَ الْأَمِينَ وَلَكِنَّ كَأْتَ مَنْ تَلْخَائِنَ Imam, salamullahi alayhi says, the honest person did not steal from you, did not cheat you, did not betray you. But you trusted the dishonest person. You trusted the dishonest person. The honest man would not cheat you. A truly honest man, honorable man, a man with integrity. Even if you give him one dollar, he'll find you and give it back to you. If he can, he'll give it back to you. But a dishonest, no matter how much you give him, he will not give it back to you, even if he appears honest. We have that, unfortunately, some people in the community. So many cases we've seen of an older brother or a younger brother, for example, stealing the inheritance. Although he comes to mosque, prays, good mu'min on the outside, but he's stolen his brother's and his sister's inheritance. Or even sometimes worse, they steal their nephew's or niece's inheritance because they have orphans. So they steal their inheritance, والعياذ بالله, and they leave them like this. And we've seen cases like that, والعياذ بالله. Such individual, what Islam is this? What Iman is this? Of course, he's a Muslim. But we tell him, go up the notch. Remember Allah and fear Allah and give. Give the money back. So we try to admonish them. We try to admonish them because Islam does not teach dishonesty. Going back to the story, this man, this businessman, appeared to be as a pious man, but he turned out to be a dishonest man. This visitor became very depressed. He said, now, what am I going to do? Who's going to believe me now? If everyone in the city praises him, thinks he's a good man, he's a virtuous man, a pious man, who's going to believe me? So he was walking there on the street depressed. A man, a local, 
person saw him, he said, what is the matter, stranger? He said, you know what? This is my story. But who's going to believe me? The, s the local man told the stranger, go see Hassan al-Khayyat, Hassan the tailor, and he will be able to help you. The man said, are you serious? He said, yes. The visitor said, you know what? Well, I've lost my money anyway, so what's the point? You know, let's go see this Hassan the tailor. What worse can happen? I've already lost my gold. He walked around. He asked, where is Hassan al-Khayyat? Hassan al-Khayyat. He thought maybe Hassan al-Khayyat, this Hassan the tailor, is a wealthy man, an influential figure. Maybe he's got some authority, some great person. He comes. He sees a man sitting against a wall, and he's stitching. He does not even have a shop. So he paused for a second and he asked around, he said, is this Hassan al-Khayyat? He told him, yeah, that is Hassan al-Khayyat. He thought to himself, he thought maybe that local man was, you know, fooling with me. You know, he was maybe making a joke with me, telling me go see Hassan al-Khayyat. What is this guy? He can't even help himself. You think he's going to help me? You know. So he started hesitating. Should I talk to him? Should I not? And he said, you know what? Forget it. I don't think this guy can even help me at all. Look at him. He's so poor. He doesn't even have a shop. He turned around and he wanted to go. Hassan al-Khayyat looked at him, noticed him. He called him. He said, stranger. He turned around. He said, were you looking for me? So the stranger, you know, couldn't say no at this stage. He said, yes. He said, what's your story? He told him, this is my story. Hassan al-Khayyat told the stranger, go back to that businessman, tell him, Hassan al-Khayyat, Hassan the tailor, says, give me back my gold, or else he will go and do the adhan. This visitor is thinking again, is this guy, I mean, what is this city? You know? That local told me, go see Hassan al-Khayyat. Hassan al-Khayyat is a person who can't even help himself. This poor tailor sitting, doesn't even have a shop. He, he stitches on the, on, the, on the street. And now he's telling me, go tell that businessman who he seems to be a wealthy man, you know, a rich person. Go tell him that Hassan tells you, give me back my gold or else I'm... What is this nonsense? You know, are they fooling with me? Are they thinking I'm, you know, what? Hassan told him, trust me, go and say this and see what happens. You know, this man said, you know what, well, I've got nothing to lose anyways. He's already taken my gold. So what else can happen? He, the visitor goes back to this businessman and he tells him, I just came from Hassan al-Khayyat. He says, give me back my gold or else he will go and do the adhan. This man said, Hassan al-Khayyat? Huh? Wait, wait, halas, halas. He goes and he brings the gold and says, here you go. This man was shocked. He says, subhanallah. I was with him the whole time telling him, ya akhi, you know, give me back my money, my gold. You know, I am a stranger here. Is this how we will treat your, the, the visitors, your guests, and so on? Nothing worked. I mentioned the name of a poor tailor. And him doing the adhan, it really moves and shakes this guy. So he became very curious. He goes back to Hassan al-Khayyat, this, this visitor, now that he's got his gold. He tells him, Hassan, what is your story, man? And what, what is the story of this adhan of yours? He says, a while back, one night after praying Salatul Isha, I was in the masjid, I prayed Salatul Isha. And then I headed back home. Back in those days, brothers and sisters, people after Salat al-Isha used to sleep. You know, there, was, there were no lights, for example. There were no TVs, internet, things that entertainment people would do. There's nothing to do at night. So people used to sleep after Isha and wake up for Salat al-Layl, pray, and then pray Salat al-Fajr and stay up the whole day. Okay. So at night it becomes dark and the city becomes dead. After Isha, it becomes dead. 
Although in this city of Edmonton, mashallah, it's also similar to this maybe. They, they've taken some of the tradition, you know. And hence the name Deadminton, you know. Nonetheless, he said, after Salatul Isha, I went back to my house. I saw a man attacking a woman. I looked carefully. I noticed this is the chief of the police, the head of the police. He is attacking a woman and no one is around. And he grabbed her, attacked her, and took her to, her to his house. And she was begging for help, but no one is helping. Some people were afraid because he is the chief of police. If they will, but what can you do to the chief of police? Especially back in those days. If you mess with him, he will finish you. And maybe even finish your whole family. Because he's got the power, he's got the authority, he's got the influence. So people were scared. And I sat down, but I don't know what can I do. I can't go help her. I can't, I can't go physically help her. But that's where I sat down and reflecting. And I thought to myself, Hassan, how can you sit down doing nothing? He had the self-admonishment. That is the, what we call in Sometimes it may be referred as the conscious. The conscious kicks in. <laughs> the Quran refers to it as a nafsul lawama. The self that starts making you feel guilty. And that self, Allah has that mechanism, Allah has put it in every human being so that he, he would guide him to the right path. He would feel guilty and repent and go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But some people choose not to. So Hassan says, I sat down thinking, I can't keep quiet like this. Someone is being harassed. Someone is being attacked. And I'm doing nothing? No. I can't be satisfied with myself. So I don't know what to do. What can I do? So then something came to my mind. I went next to the Sultan's palace. The Sultan's palace. And I started doing adhan. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And so on and so forth. At night. The sultan got up, the king got up. He started shouting from the window, Who is this? Arrest this man, I'm trying to sleep. They arrested him, said, Bring him here, cut his head off. Hassan said, Wait, wait. You didn't ask me why I was doing this. The sultan said, Well, why were you doing this? He said, This is what I saw. I saw the chief of police attacking a woman. And taking her to her to his house. And she's begging for help. And no one is able to help her. And that's why I woke you up. Your majesty. Because you are just. And you don't like oppression. And justice must be served. The sultan told him. He said we'll see if you're truthful. He sent some guard with Hassan. He says go with Hassan Khayyat to the house of the chief of police they go and surely they do indeed find him with that lady and she's begging for help so they do arrest him they arrest him they bring him to justice at night the king before the king and he gets punished the chief of police the sultan then becomes impressed with Hassan al khayyat he tells him Hassan you did such a wonderful job Every time in the city you hear or you see someone being oppressed and injustice is being committed against somebody, come and say the adhan immediately. Now you've gained my trust. Just say, your words are enough now. Your testimony is enough. That so-and-so has oppressed someone or so-and-so has been injustice against someone. That's enough. And hence... People became scared of Hassan al khayyat The self-admonishment is very important because if someone does not really admonish himself, does not think about the consequences of his actions, his life, then he will lose dunya and akhirah. And this brings us to Muslim ibn Aqil. 
that hadith is taught by Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam and he's teaching it to us the Shia my dear brothers and my dear sisters because he wants us to be the best we can one day a group of Shia came to Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam they came to, to, to him and he was admonishing them he noticed they were not paying attention to him can you imagine sitting with Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam and he's admonishing you and you're playing around you're not paying attention that he became angry with them he said my words if they were to fall on a heart it would pierce that heart it means the words of wisdom the words of awakening the words that wake a human being up on a heart he is referring to a heart that's alive a living heart a heart that can understand when you listen to the words of the Imam the words of admonishment indeed they pierce your heart pierce your heart they wake you up so Imam does not want us to be like these individuals they were also Shia of the Imam Salam Allah Ali, followers of the Imam they came to see him because they love him they respect him that's why brothers and sisters always always think about Allah and think about your actions and ask yourself what am I doing in my life have I hurt someone have I taken stand with my brother or my sister against a poor lady or a poor man or a poor orphan because he's my brother or she's my sister? I have hurt someone badly. Then what am I going to say to Allah on the Day of Judgment? Have I taken someone's wealth? Have I attacked someone? Have I mistreated somebody? Do the self-admonishment. When you do the self-admonishment, then you'll find that when people admonish you, there will be an impact. Impact. Muslim Ibn Aqil came to Kufa. People of Kufa supported him initially. Stood with him. But then when Ibn Ziyad came, he started spending money, spreading fear into their hearts they did not think about their akhirah imagine if the people of Kufa supported Imam Hussein Ibn Ziyad would not have been able to even get power of it where would he get the power the support nobody they would have destroyed Ibn Ziyad history would have changed but they became cowards the admonishments of Muslim Ibn Aqil started falling on deaf ears deaf ears because those people did not realize that they're being imprisoned for eternity they're giving up their freedom they're becoming enslaved when they brought the head of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam before Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad a blind man called Abdullah ibn Afif al Azdi he lost one eye fighting with Imam Ali and Safin and the other one in Jamal. One in Jamal, one in Safin. And he became blind. True Shia, a lover of Ahlul Bayt. When he saw Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad or when he heard him beating the head of Imam al Hussein, sallallahu alayhi, he got up and he said, Remove your hands from the lips of Abi Abdullah. O people of Kufa, may you be cursed for allowing him. To become your leader indeed you have submitted to slavery you've enslaved yourselves indeed and then he was captured and killed salamullah this was a brave man he was a brave man this abdullah they captured him and he continued fighting until they captured him he said when i was always praying to allah to give me shahada martyrdom but when I lost my eyes and I became blind, I lost hope of shahada. But now I guess today Allah has accepted my dua and indeed Allah granted him shahada. If people had thought this way, they would have supported Imam Hussein. But sometimes we don't think about the consequences. We think of today. We don't think of, of tomorrow what will happen. We don't have a vision. We don't have self-admonishment, time to reflect. If I deviate some people in the community or in the society, what are the consequences? What will happen? We don't think about this. 
but rather we think of the wealth and the power. That's what we think about. If I stab someone in the back in the community, what will happen? What goes around comes around, subhanAllah. You hurt someone today, you badmouth someone today, and you do it in front of everyone, tomorrow the same thing will be done to you. Wait and see. Allah is just. It may happen 20 years later, 30 years later, but it will happen. People don't have the, the vision, the time. You know, one day one of the shaykhs, may Allah bless his soul, he says, I was at someone's house, then we hear, you know, some fighting, crying, shouting, we go out of the house, I see an old man fighting with a young man. The young man then slaps the old man and run away. I ask, what's going on? They say, this old man is the father, the young man is the son. He slapped his father. I told the father, he started crying. I came to him, the son then ran away. Everyone's looking at him, he became embarrassed, he ran away. The father looked at, at the, the sheikh. The sheikh looked at the father and said, Yeah, sheikh, yeah, yeah, old man, don't worry about him. You know, these are young men. Sometimes they don't think what they do. They don't realize what they're doing. So don't cry. Try to comfort the old man, the sheikh. May Allah bless us all, the sheikh. The old man looked at the sheikh and said, Sheikh, I'm not crying because he hit me. He said, because 40 years ago, I hit my father the same way he did. SubhanAllah. Allah has given it back to me now 40 years later. I remembered what I did to my father. That's why I'm crying. What goes around comes around. People don't realize this. This is dunya. Justice will be served. Justice will be served. When you hurt someone, you will be hurt. Muslim ibn Aqil, because of this, people left him all alone. They did not think. He lost all his supporters. And then one day, he comes and he prays in the masjid, looks behind, no one is behind him praying. Nobody. He walks out on the streets alone. An old lady takes him in after she recognizes he is Muslim ibn Aqil, the ambassador of Imam al Hussein. He spends the night at her place. Then, unfortunately, her son discovers that Muslim is there. He goes and he tells Awaydillah ibn Ziyad. They send him the army. The army comes in the morning and starts attacking Muslim ibn Aqil. He starts fighting bravely. The army keeps on sending to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, send us more men and more men. He fights them bravely and they keep on asking for more men to fight against him. Until Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad said to them, I sent you to capture one man. I did not send you to capture an army. Why do you need so many men? They told him, is this an ordinary man you told us to go capture? This is Muslim ibn Aqil. This is one of the swords of Bani Hashim. He comes from that noble family, that bravery. He is not an ordinary man. Send us more men. They sent him about 1,000 men just to fight one man. And he fought against them bravely and they still could not capture him. They still, because haqq, truth is always brave and strong. Batil, falsehood is always weak and shaken. And hence, it might take more than 1,000 to capture one man, one man. He fought against them bravely until they dug a hole and he fell into the hole. That's when they managed to capture him. They took him to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They had an exchange of words. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad started calling him some names. But Muslim ibn Aqil with his integrity and honor said, My master is Abi Abdullah al-Husayn. 
Then Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad tells him, tells the people, the guards, to go take them, take him up to the palace roof, cut his head off, and throw his body from the top of the palace. Those people who cut heads off today are the followers of such people like Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They learned from them. Rasulullah, Amir al Mu'mineen, Ahlul Bayt never did this. Never. Not a single example in history exists with them doing it. It is these men who distorted the whole religion, and those people are following their example. When he takes him to the rooftop, Muslim ibn Aqil tells the guard, Give me a few minutes, let me pray to Ruk'at Salat. It means he was on the state of wudu. It's mustahab, brothers and sisters, always to be in the state of wudu and to always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He prayed to Ruk'at Salat, then he got up and turned towards Medina, uh, towards Mecca, and he said, Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. This is your cousin Muslim ibn Aqil, all alone in Kufa. At that time, Imam Hussein had left Mecca. This was on Arafah, on the day of Arafah. He had just left Mecca. It is said, the narrator said, Imam al Hussein was sitting with a group of people. He got up at that moment and he said, Wa alayka salamu ya Muslim. And peace be upon you, ya Muslim. Brothers and sisters, every time you say, Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah, wherever you are, Imam al Hussein will respond to you. Just like he responded to Muslims. So every day send your salam to Abi Abdullah. Send your heart to Karbala. For indeed, he will remember you. He will greet you back. And then the enemy of Allah struck Muslim once on his neck. Nothing happened to him. He hit him a second time. His head separated from his body. They threw the body of Muslim on the streets and they started dragging him. Ah, 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 Oh, a Muslim was all alone, gharib in Kufa. And so is our Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Although he was in his own city of Medina when he was fed the poison, but today he is indeed a stranger, a gharib in his own city of Medina. You look at his grave and the way it is, people cannot even visit him. People cannot even recite Musiba next to his grave without being attacked and harassed and bothered and imprisoned. And indeed, subhanallah, in his will, Imam al-Baqir's will to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he gives him money and he says, my son, use some of this money to hold the Aza. Imam al-Baqir gives money to Imam al-Sadiq to have Aza. Just like you brothers and sisters, mu'mineen and mu'minat, Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Baqir, the Imams love you to be here. They love to see you here. They will remember you. Spend money and invest on these majalis for our Imams invested money on such majalis. And then Imam al-Baqir told Imam al-Sadiq and use some of the money to buy candles and light them on my grave. It is as if Imam al-Baqir is telling the Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and telling all of us one day will come when there will be no light in my grave. When people can't come freely and do ziyara on my grave. Ah, assalamu alayka ya ibn Rasulillah. السلام عليك يا أبا جعفر يا محمد الباقر ورحمة الله وبركاته إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا هي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك بسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الإمام الباقر في الدنيا عاجلا يا الله وشفاعته في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا اللهم اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة سلام الله عليها إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح موات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات